This is a brief preamble to the video you're going to see right now, and I'm going to call it J'accuse, like Emile Zola in, 19, in 1898, uh, published in the newspaper, accused the government of falsely imprisoning Dreyfus, who was, uh, and uh, accusing the government of anti-Semitism in the, uh, in the uh, conviction of Dreyfus uh, to be imprisoned uh, falsely, and he showed how the government had fudged the details and he had to escape. He was accused of libel. I, I'm not going to libel anybody here. I'm just saying these guys are lying. They're just, uh, they're just being uh, sycophants for the man of the cabal. In the tradition of Voltaire, écrasé l'enfant. Voltaire famously standing up for the underdog, for the vulnerable during the Enlightenment. Emile Zola, j'accuse. A few days ago, I made some comments on a guy called Robert Stone making a documentary, which I haven't seen. I saw the trailer, but I did a little more research and I came across a panel, a panel discussion with this person talking about his movie, Pandora's Promise. I wonder why nobody asks him uh, about the title in this, but I'm going to walk through this and what I sometimes do is I play something in the background and comment on it. And of course, there is so much at stake at this point in our history. Human history now is faced with a radical, we need a revision of the way we approach each other through a fundamental, through a fundamental caring, not self-serving, but caring. And there are people that are going to come out and posture as as individuals that appear to be rational, conscious, reflective, thoughtful people. And this is almost insidious, it's malicious. And I find that this is so, it is a core, it's attack against our core of humanity, using rationality and calm speech and ridiculing those who have passion for our well-being. People of conscience who come out with passionate appeals towards our well-being, for our well-being. Now I'm going to play in the background occasional clips from this discussion. It's called Talks at Google, a panel, a bunch of sycophants. It's a love-in for a pro-nuclear rally. This is a pro-nuclear rally. There is no one in opposition. Obviously, they all love each other and they all love in and uh, have their little say. And I'm gonna play this. Let me start off here. I'm gonna play. Google is about starting conversations with data and trying to start with some basic scientific observations and getting the measurements right. And I think that's one of the things that you guys could be proudest of is that you started from a fact basis as opposed to an emotional one. <laughs> All right, people like me, people like Kevin Blanche, Miss Milky the Clown, Radchick, people who have exposed other people, who have exposed the fact that we are now in the middle of the most treacherous, dangerous event in human history, Going back to uh, extinction level events, as I've said, I believe this to be an extinction level event. Oh, chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. You people have done your research. You're going on the data, the data that suits your particular attitude. They're going to accuse people like me now of being emotional about this and not using data. Well, the data they exclude is the data of deformations in Chernobyl, there is an exclusion zone. They refuse to look at this, that six, almost 600,000 soldiers died from the exposure to the radiation from Chernobyl over a period of years. Obviously, it's cumulative. This radiation is cumulative. It doesn't disappear like uh, a bit of rotten smell in your compost. It doesn't disappear and dissipate into the ground. This radiation lasts thousands of years, a long time. And in that sense, it is cumulative. It is not something that disappears. And of course, we are ridiculed. 
because we understand this, but it's not suitable to their cause. Their cause is nuclear energy with no opposition. They refuse opposition. Just to let you know who's on this panel, let's have a let's have a I'm listen. Robert Stone. I'm the producer and director of the film. This is Stuart Brand, Gwyneth Cravens, Mark Linus, Michael Schellenberger, all of whom started off being very anti-nuclear. All right, so there is your basic panel, and now the next clip will be, this is the most damning of statements, right off the bat, the most damning of statements, and I will clarify what I mean. Let's listen to this person. The view that we all sort of came to in our own ways is that cheap, clean energy is arguably the most important thing from a human development and an environmental perspective. From a cheap, from cheap clean energy, Everybody in the world can have you know, medicines, they can have clean water, they can have uh, longer lifespans, healthier lives, and you can use that energy then to grow more food on less land. All right, I'm going to stop him here because we're being blackmailed now with this irrational logic. And of course, the assumption being, to begin with, that cheap, clean energy, indisputably everything, everything on our planet focuses on producing cheap, clean energy, possibly even free energy. The uh, civilization would be a good idea with such a uh, panacea of, uh, wonderful, of wonderful, uh, wonderfulness of free energy, clean energy. Yes, of course, this is what we're looking for. And now the assumption on this person's part is that we think, we think we automatically, because they used to be anti-nuclear, but now they've realized it's clean. They've understood nuclear to be clean. Have you made a quick check on what the results of radiation on biological matter is, what it looks like, the growths? You have uh, uh, aberrations in the genome, in the DNA, from radiation. Now you call this clean. Of course, we're supposed to be like little lemmings understanding that it's, oh, of course, nuclear is clean. You don't see some black smoke coming out or nuclear radiation doesn't show up as a yellow mist floating over us like uh, uh, the, the mist in 1950, Paul Newman, I think there was a movie, The Mist. You see this yellow, this smoky substance coming at you. No, radiation doesn't look like that, of course not. So they can claim that nuclear is clean and cheap. The second part of the argument, cheap, nuclear cheap, uh, Hanford, Hanford, they're talking about 150 million, no, sorry, 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 100 billion dollar cleanup cost on, uh, on, on the Hanford site. Now, talk about Hanford is one thing. Now, how about Fukushima? How about cleanup at Fukushima? They haven't even attempted a cleanup. We're looking at hundreds of billions of dollars in cleanup costs. Never mind, never mind the fact that the Pacific Ocean will be irradiated for thousands of years, already has begun. Now, the argument being these, these I, I, I don't know how to express this, this outrage I feel at the logic, the blackmail that most ordinary people will listen to this. Oh, they sound very calm. So if I'm standing here ripping on my hair saying, hey, hey, it's falling apart. Of course, this is the strategy, people. When you hear somebody speaking softly and gently about this, it is basically to cover up the fact that we're under such incredible attack we're going to listen to this liar. We're not going to listen to him because he has just exposed himself twice. Cheap and clean. Neither of, neither of those two points is true and can be dissected and dismantled in minutes. I'm not an expert, but I understand immediately that this is one big, huge lie. If you look at Chernobyl, Millions have died at Chernobyl. They say only 56 people died. This is, their, this is their mantra. Nobody dies. Nobody has died from Fukushima. This is their mantra. And millions have died from Chernobyl. And many, many more millions will die from Fukushima because no one is stepping in to clean this, this toxic shit off the planet. Now he's going to invoke the immunization czar, the immunization czar of Africa, Bill Gates, what does he have to say? 
so this is why Bill Gates says cheap clean energy is sort of the biggest human development goal of the 21st century. Now, if Bill Gates says it, we're really going to follow this, right? The Bill Gates, the, the person who probably absconded with more copyright inf uh, material. I'm not an expert again on this. It's my opinion. But uh, to be that rich, like Warren Buffett, you're an insider. You're an insider. You're not going to get there by being uh, uh, clever and smart. Yeah, you may be clever and smart at stealing things, I guess. I don't know how that works. But the point is to listen to somebody that uh, says clean. Again, he'll keep bringing up clean and cheap. And the assumption is that we're all going to sit there in the front row and nod like little sycophants, like the, uh, the little doll in the back of the car, the little dog, his head is going up and down because the car is moving. So the car is moving and the head goes up and down and you have compliance from the dog in the back of the car. The mechanical little dog with a loose head on it that goes up and down. That's you and me. That's what we're supposed to do. Now let's go to the next level of rational irrationality. Listen to this hack. That the most energy efficient way to live is, is right on the edge of desperate poverty. In the favelas and slums of the world, there are people who are really using very, very little material and very, very little energy. They are so green and they are so eager to stop being that kind of green. And the main economic and demographic event in the world now is people are getting the hell out of poverty all over the world. Where you've been traveling, I think you're seeing this. Oh yeah, we're, we're really, really getting the hell out of slums. poverty. People are in those desperate slums back, rather than back in the village, because in the village they were stuck. In town they've got a shot, and they're taking that shot. And you'll see wires everywhere because they need Smug. electricity Smug. to do all the stuff that means being part of the city. But as you're finding in Pakistan and elsewhere, if it's uneven if it's unreliable electricity then everything slows down school slows down medicine slows down if you can get the one billion richest people in the world to cut their energy consumption in half to get the other seven or eight billion people up to that standard you're still going to have to triple or maybe quadruple yeah. global energy consumption so the math actually doesn't work out all right that's uh, the two bits worse worth from these two guys of course now here comes the attack against the vulnerable. He's going to say, well, all those mouths that need to be fed and need to be TV rised with uh, wires of electricity going in their houses, they're going to be the ones that are going to demand. They're going to demand. They all want to come online. Well, they go from the village into the uh, metropolises and they live twice as worse a life the opportunities that arise in those cities, yeah, you have maybe uh, one in a uh, thousand or 10,000 will actually accomplish a level of existence greater than what they had, what he says in the village, of course. He's going to say everybody wants to live like us in cities. He looks at himself. His point of view is that of the winning team. And he pretends to be on their side and saying, we need to think about these poor people that have no concept of what it means to be rich. We'll teach them how to be rich. We need to produce energy for nothing. Cheap, clean energy like nuclear is what they need. He's going to use this, this argument about the poor people on the planet. We're really looking out for you poor people. What, what a lie. What a complete total lie. And then the other charlatan comes on and he says, well, of course, if the billion richest guys... Uh, if we use them as an example, just imagine what happens when all these other billions want to do the same thing that we want to do. Well, have you ever thought about the fact that what you're doing, the billion richest, it's not what the other six billion would like to do, but is what the existing one billion maybe should reconsider. Maybe this whole idea of progress and this idea of, uh, what do they call that? GDP when it goes up every year. Well, how about stepping back just for a minute and getting a little bit closer to what you call those desperate people in the slums, in the uh, urban centers of Pakistan or India. How about stepping back and cutting back the expectation of growth? That's what it is, growth. So anyway, this, this, this argument is so absolutely irrational. It is, it reeks, it reeks. I'm going to preempt this next guy that is going to make his little two-bit worth of uh, irrationality.
he says that the anti-nuclear movement uh, has stopped the production of nuclear plants since the 1960s, early 70s, and instead we have coal-fired plants. Now, I have always said, we're a dirty bunch of bastards who aren't willing to clean up something that is easily cleaned up. The scrubbers and coal plants have been introduced in all of Germany. All the coal plants in Germany are producing energy from coal plants that is 99% clean. Now, he, he is, as an environmentalist, why wouldn't he know this? He's going to say that we are really contributing to, uh, he'll say climate change. That'll be the next topic. You notice how they don't say global warming, they say climate change, because there is now evidence we're cooling, not heating. Anyway, that's another issue. But the fact is, he says, the anti-nuclear contingent has prevented nuclear plants from being built over the last 40 years and replaced by coal plants. Now, how could that be? That, uh, there are almost 500, 500 of these brutal, lethal reactors, plants, nuclear plants, all over the planet. And I think there is 150 or so in the US alone. How can he claim that the anti-nuclear lobby has prevented the building of these plants? These plants are everywhere. Listen to this guy. The fact that we've got enough mined uranium and spent fuel already to run the entire country at 80 gigawatts, which is its current energy consumption, um, for 500 years is interesting. And you can run the US for, for 1,000 years on stuff that's already sitting around in junkyards in Kentucky. You know, we don't I don't know what he means, that junkyard in Kentucky. What's sitting in the junkyard in Kentucky? I hope he's not talking about spent fuel plants, but he's talking about some sort of matter that could be turned into nuclear fuel. He's now insinuating, he's now driving his logic towards the fact that, oh, we've got all this uranium. It's next to nothing. Uranium mining is one of the dirtiest, ugliest businesses ever on the planet. It's the worst of the worst kind of mining. This is a horrible stuff. It is basically radiating as it is being mined, and it has to be controlled in these reactors. They make whatever they make in uh, nuclear fuel that ends up in a toxic heap in what are called fuel pools, thousands and thousands of tons of stuff we don't know what to do with. Uh, I won't go there yet. Let's listen to them some more. have a fundamental energy shortage, uh, which is the complete reverse of the way we've always had this discussion. Why do you need to conserve energy and switch everything, you know, or, or, or say to Chinese that they can't English accent. living that we will become, you know, there is no shortage of energy. We've just got to accept that we're going to do use different technologies. The reality is that since the anti-nuclear movement really came up in the early 1970s, maybe a bit earlier, we got the no US has plans. invested in 150 new coal-fired power stations. So every single nuclear plant that was proposed and then cancelled because of anti-nuclear activism either was replaced by a coal plant right there, and in some places they actually tore out the places where the reactors were going to put, and they put coal, coal boilers in the exact same locations, or somewhere else. And so the environmental movement has made the world safe for coal, uh, unintentionally, of course, and somehow now has to look to a future where they want to eliminate coal, just as the rest of the world, Asia, China, um, India, so on, are getting to the standard of living or hoping to get to Okay, okay, blah, 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 blah. The environmental movement has made the planet safe for coal. What a bunch of hooey. Well, how ridiculous is that? We have almost... 500 nuclear plants around the planet and the environmental movement has made it good for coal. The environmental movement has been a, a huge, a huge failure on every level. And the most important level of failure is, is countering nuclear plants on our planet. We don't need this stuff to survive. We can do it another way and the environmentalists have dropped the ball on this. They were a front. They were a ruse. It's, it's irrational to actually argue this way. These people are arguing and it's totally irrational when you really listen to them think about it. Number one, clean. Number two, uh, uh, it's, it's like free energy. Number three, environmentalism has actually made the planet better for coal. Pause. Now the next guy that's going to chime in is going to talk about cost. Now just listen to the low numbers. He's referring to what he thinks is catastrophic in terms of cost. Listen to this. We're starting to realize real costs for not dealing with climate change. I mean, that's Robert Stone. Hurricane and Sandy, I think, has cost sixty billion dollars. You know, what if we get another one next year? You know, I mean, that could happen. 
Oh, $60 billion, Hurricane Sandy. Yes, of course, Hurricane Sandy, a tragedy. People are still reeling from Hurricane Sandy because the uh, agencies that are supposed to be out there helping people to recover from this storm, as in Katrina, people were left destitute and never helped again. This is a whole other story again, of course, but he brings up the figure of $60 billion. What did I just say about Hanford? Hanford, conservatively, conservatively, 100 to 150 billion on one plant, on one plant. Now he is leading into the fact that of course, carbon, carbon, we breathe carbon. We are carbon breathers. We carbon dioxide comes out of our lungs. Six, seven billion people breathing carbon dioxide. What a bunch of dirty, what a dirty bunch we are breathing carbon dioxide. This is what he's referring to. The elites, the winning team, the winning team has the argument that carbon dioxide is bad. Not the stuff they're breathing, not the cars they're driving, not the Al Gore mansions on the beach that he knows the water level isn't gonna go up because why would he buy a mansion on the beach? This is the rationale. We're supposed to buy and eat the pablum of these, this, these are lies. And in my, in my humble opinion, I don't know what liability, what libel, but nobody, comes up against these guys. Where is the person on the panel saying, why are you saying this bullshit? This is not true. This is not how it works. 60 billion on Katrina or 60 billion on Sandy is a pittance compared to what the cleanup is on Fukushima or Hanford or Chernobyl, which is collapsing again. They have to create a completely new covering over Chernobyl, nobody talks about this. The cement the borium with cement, whatever they have to pour on this, is increasing every day in order to contain the radiation, the meltdown, the China syndrome going on in Chernobyl as well. This is not contained and it costs billions and billions of dollars and they're, they're bringing in this carbon thing. Give me carbon any day. Give me carbon any day. <coughs> and now comes the mea culpa moment in this discussion, this panel discussion, the mea culpa, where they admit to have been wrong. And like they look back on who they were 40 years ago, snot-nosed little idiot hippies that's, that had a passion, a love for something. The hippie movement, however long it lasted, it was a short period of time, a year, year and a half, however long that period lasted, I was on the fringe of that movement. It was a movement of excitement of feeling that there was an overall sense of caring for who we were. A bit mindless maybe, a bit kind of uh, spaced out, juiced out, you know? It's like taking all the drugs and crap that people did and then like Abby Hoffman, they end up in Wall Street and he's talking about himself. Now he was one of those hippies and he's going to disparage his history. The best part of that history was never fulfilled. It, it never came to fruition. And now he's ridiculing that and now comes this mea culpa moment, which makes him an authority on, I have recognized the wrong that I have done. Yes, of course, the hippie movement was a gigantic, gigantic failure because it never ended up in what it should have ended up. And that was with people caring the fundamental principle of caring for each other and not go for the profit, not go for the, the immediate profit to create these horrible nuclear plants with all this toxic waste that can't be gotten rid of. We have no clue how to get rid of it and the children for the next 100 generations are gonna look back on us and say, what an ugly, dirty bunch of bastards they were and he's gonna excuse us. Let's see what he has to say. Mea culpa, now I've seen the light. My fellow environmentalists have this romantic attachment to a certain view of the world, which does not fit with actually dealing with the engineering. But, but, but isn't there address. isn't there another problem, which is people are loath to change their minds and admit that they were wrong? And you all each, you all did it. in the movie, say this is what I thought. I, some new data came along, and I changed my mind. Well, this is the this is the difference between the science. No, you don't agree with that. Go ahead. This is the difference between evidence driven and ideology driven. Because oh. ideology, you you double down on your theory of the world, even though it's wrong. Most documentaries function and are marketed and have a life out in the world by reinforcing people's preconceptions about the world. What? We okay, he's gonna talk about the art side of things and this is an attack I feel personally against me. People of intuition, people that he dismisses, the hippies, there were intuitive people in that group of hippies. You have a whole 
You have a group of magnificent poets that emerged. The beats, sound poetry, uh, based on data in many ways, but there were people of vision and understanding that we can't go on the same way. He will disparage that. He will disparage the artist. It's the nuclear industry making art. And I have no doubt, I don't have any uh, research or proof on this, but I would not be surprised if the nuclear industry was very favorable. Well, of course they were favorable for this movie. I don't know whether the guy got money or not, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did because he's now disparaging me. He's disparaging artists, artists of intuition. And as an artist, I say, I knew when Fukushima blew up the next day, it took me actually, no, it took me like, a, I did my first uh, post a week. It had to settle in a little bit, I guess. Not like Blanche, who on the next day came out screaming and shouting that we're looking at a major, major disaster. Okay, let me, uh, let me just pause for a second. I think I'll leave it after this. This is uh, continuing now with the, uh, the head guy, Stone, talking, and now it goes into esoterica. Here is the, re here is the revelation the real truth. This is how, this is like the turtle going into its shell. This is how, what religion does. He even refers to this, the turtle going, retreating back into its shell, into its source. The source being some kind of uh, mystical notion about c communing with some kind of magical universe of understanding, something that has made me fundamentally change. All you people out there aren't changing your mind because you're not connected to this mystical connection. Let's have a, let's have a listen to this stone guy talking what about What we've done here with this movie is to take a different tack. It's, and it's not like coming at you in your face and saying, oh, you're wrong, this is why you're wrong. It's we are you. And we <laughs> were wrong about some things. We and are we were you. wrong n for a whole variety of reasons because we were given information that was wrong. I am you. We are we. We are together. We are all one. Mm -hmm. And so it takes you on a journey. But what I found, journey. and this was one Mystical. of the surprises that came out of showing it at Sundance, is that it. Oh, that's interesting. Sundance, Redford. Blanche has talked about Redford, uh, Redford being a, a capitulating to this cartel, capitulating. For what? He has no children, maybe. Actually converting, like, it's almost, it's like in a, a religious conversion. It's actually a really, I don't know if the right, the right word is enjoyable. Oh, it's a careful. cathartic experience. It's actually more a more satisfying experience. Careful, don't say religious. He caught himself, he caught himself. Oh no, he's gonna go into Greek drama now. He's gonna talk about catharsis. He's going to talk about the great sort of catharsis. He's gonna go into Aeschylus or whoever he's gonna go into. Uh, he caught himself. Ah, it's too late. You, uh, you spilled the beans. Than being told what you already believe. Like that's nice to be told, oh, I'm right. But it's actually even, it's even more exhilarating to have your mind change or to no not to have your mind change but to change your mind to come to your own conclusions about something all right here you go there's the exercise for this person he needed to have a catharsis some religious moment because he can't get it from the catholics he can't get it from the buddhists he can't get it from the hindus he can't get it from art but he'll get it from the radiation this is his conclusion. He had a catharsis, a change of mind, because the information coming at him wasn't doing him any good to have a, or rather the information coming to him was now accepted to be true, which allowed him to change his mind, which was the purpose of the exercise to go through a moment of epiphany because he's not had a breakthrough. Like all the great artists in history have had breakthroughs. They don't have to make this shit up. They don't have to create fictitious, erroneous lies in order to feel they're part of something magical, mystical, transformative. This is what we're all looking for, of course, the same as this person. He's looking for a mystical transformation for himself and he's going to run into this glow, into this, I don't know what temperature glow this is at the center of a reactor. You cannot, you cannot control this stuff, but he feels that the epiphany has reached him through having changed his mind and that's what it's all about. This is, and it goes on, these guys go on. And I was, I, man, did I get some uh, shit in my inbox on having uh, countered, this, uh, countered this Pandora's Promise movie. I find, I find this is something that will go down in history as the most 
ignominious time and the most vicious people. This I would equate to the period of time of fascism and communism under Stalin, under Mussolini, under Hitler, under Franco. These times will be seen as a holiday for humanity when we'll get to the end of this nuclear Armageddon. This is not my opinion. This is factually shown. You look at the picture of deformations of children. You look at the fact that they have exclusion zones where these places blow up. And who's to say how many or how few will blow up? They said none of them will ever blow up because they're so safe. And now all the safeguards are put into place. You know how much the earth moves? How, how frequently the earth is shifting and moving, especially now. The uh, influence of the sun. And notice how they always refer now to climate, uh, to climate change, not global warming. 10 years ago, it was global warming. Now it's all climate change because they have been exposed. They have to change their tune. People, nuclear energy is the most lethal, dangerous substance. The nuclear isotopes released from not only damaged plants, but on a continuous basis. This has been shown, this has been proven. We'll sink the ship. It's an extinction level event and these people are sitting by on the sidelines clapping while it's happening.